Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Okay, today we're going to dive into the everyday experience of living with a legend, the iconic Ferrari Testarossa, the symbol of the 80s. But what does this car really like to live with? Well, let's find out. Starting the car is actually a part of the, the joy of this experience is the sound of the starter alone. I swear it sounds like what a, a 250 GTO or one of the Colombo engines sounds like. Um, but uh, the whine of the engine, uh, particularly the start motor, is really amazing. Now, you're going to hear the injector check valve running at the beginning, making a bit of a popping sound. This is going to run for about five minutes, and you really can't do much with the car until that actually finishes and the engine warms up, or at least that valve stops. Now, if there's one thing the Testarossa is very famous for, it's the weight of the steering. Uh, slow speeds, this car really is quite difficult uh, or challenging to drive. You really need to keep the, when it's, in, when it's moving, it's actually working pretty well. But uh, don't even think about trying to parallel park this car. Um, yeah, but once you're moving, it's not so bad. Of course, it is wide. You really need to keep your eyes open. But yeah, once the car is moving, everything seems pretty straightforward uh, or similar to any other analog car. But if you want a really good steering feel weight, this is the car to have, you just have to pay for it. All right, so visibility in this car in terms of gauges is actually really good. So tachometer, speedometer, oil pressure, water temperature uh, are the primary gauges. Um, you've got uh, oil temperature, um, Fuel, fuel capacity, of course, and your trip odometer are all really easy to see. On my particular car, the, uh, the odometer itself <laughs> is one of the bugs of a classic car, but it's running at three times the normal speed right now, probably even faster. Um, thankfully, I track all the kilometers that I'm using, but this is a typical problem with classic cars. There's always something physically going wrong with it. To travel in this car over long distances, I find it's much better than the 328. Um, although the seats maybe seem a little bit uncomfortable from the, from the design, they look quite flat. Uh, they don't look necessarily very anatomic, but they are really comfortable. So it is a good spot to spend a lot of time in. The size of the cabin, you can see here, I'm 174 centimeters tall. Uh, I'm right on the ceiling, so if you are a tall person, uh, it is a bit of a challenging cabin. Uh, and of course it has a typical Italian experience where the pedals are off to the side, uh, which you just have to get used to. You know, if you have um, longer arms, of course, you're gonna, be, you're gonna be at home here. You can throw the seat back further. The rake of the steering wheel, of course, is also very typical Italian. It's unusual, but it's part of the experience. What I really love about this car, though, is the positioning of the, of the gear shift. This is really, really perfect, okay? Right around your hip level. Uh, it just feels great. And the throws are, I find, are really perfect for this car. Uh, they are further, of course, but yeah, it just makes sense. The one big change of this car versus obviously the Boxer uh, was the positioning of the radiators. One of the goals when they set out to design this car was to improve that component of the car, the actual cooling system. That meant from moving the radiators in the front of the car to the side and flanking the doors, or just behind the doors. And by doing that, they also made the cabin wider, so it's more spacious. And as a result, it is not as warm or anywhere near as warm as the Boxer or the 328 or 308, for example. Uh, so this is a big change. The actual air conditioning in the car is fantastic. Now, I haven't had it running yet. If I turn it on now, you might be able to hear it. Um, but it blows extremely cold, at least for my car. Uh, so it is going to be good for the warmer temperatures that we're experiencing. Now the one thing, of course, that's a little funny, strange on the Testarossa, really wasn't thought about as a car with a radio or needing a radio, but the placement of the radio, of course, is logical. But you've got this cover over top of it uh, to prevent it from being stolen, I guess. Uh, and it doesn't go up high enough, so you can't really see it. I really don't use the radio, so it doesn't really matter to me, but it is a little strange, of course. And beside it, of course, you have the world's largest vanity mirror uh, in this car. I don't know actually anybody that would ever use it in the 80s, probably. 
but uh, you know, accessing the uh, the vanity mirror, you've got this little switch, and then it pops open this immensely, immensely large uh, mirror. If you need to do your makeup, uh, the Testarossa is definitely the car you want to have. Sitting in the car in traffic is is actually pretty good. The car. Uh, temperature wise it manages it very well um, so you can be sitting in stop and go traffic and I've unfortunately have been uh, and you don't really see the needles move too much the air conditioner does work great as I said so yeah to think of this car as a longer trips or you know uh, to deal with normal life maybe in the metropolitan area this is not such a bad place to be quite often this car is actually really given credit for being a, a supercar from the 80s that you can live with for example, if you're in traffic in this car uh, and you're worried about overheating, not a problem. This car can sit. Uh, you know, the radiators are running pretty much uh, from the from the time the car starts, and it really does keep the temperature where it should be all the time, at least in my experience. Um, and as I said before, the air conditioning in this car is amazing. So longer trips, you can keep this dialed up, turn it way back uh, to the uh, to the lowest temperatures, and you're going to be uh, in a situation that's very similar to your modern day car. So the noise of the Testarossa is really interesting. I find on the inside of the car, it is really, really nice. All right, it's what I would expect. It's not as loud as the 328. I have a, I have a uh, Tubi style system on the 328, but I find in the car, this car does sound great. Outside, of course, it's pretty quiet. And I probably will upgrade the exhaust system to a Tubi system when I do the, when I do the belt service on this car next because uh, I would like it to be in line with what you expect it to be. And there are owners out there, of course, that have Tubi systems and, and uh, they're extremely happy with them. Yes, it's going to be a level louder, but it just fits the car and I just find this is just a little bit too, yeah, too quiet for my taste. Of course, the star of this car is really the engine in the back. The flat V12 really is an amazing beast. The rev range on this car is surprisingly low. Uh, you'll be quite surprised uh, where the where the action really starts. And uh, redline in this car is actually listed at just a bit under seven. And I find the sweet spot on this car really is around four and a half. Uh, it starts to really come into its own. So, in terms of uh, in terms of a, a car that will surprise you, the Testarossa really will. But the engine noise is amazing even if it is a little bit understated without the 2b system uh, it is really the star of this car the one thing i find quite funny about the legend of the testarossa is its reputation for poor handling at least the first generation and i think that's kind of funny because reputation compared to what all right this car is made in 1990 or probably late 1990 it's a 91 car and yes it it does uh, have the design decision to have the transmission underneath the engine. Of course, that pushed the engine up higher and the center of gravity of the car is higher. But compared to cars of that day, this car still is pretty amazing, especially when you get it on the type, type of roads where I live. So I find it quite funny when people are criticizing the car where 90% of the time they're poker straight. And on the roads you can see here where I am right now, uh, this car lays very flat, all right, it feels very planted, and this isn't even really turning. Of course, it's higher speed roads, and that's where the Testarossa does really excel. But I think that reputation isn't really justified that it isn't a, isn't a great handling car. Is the 328 or cars, uh, sports cars better? Yes, of course they are. But I don't think anybody would be really disappointed with what this car delivers. You just have to have your expectations in check. Okay, so out making this video about living with a Testarossa and what is it like to really have it, what happens? I have a mechanical problem. All right, so my fuel pump on the left side has stopped working or is essentially more or less dead. And that resulted in a pretty heavy misfire, loss of power, uh, actually a little bit of flame coming out the left side. So this is living with a classic car. It doesn't get any more real time than this. Now I'm waiting for my uh, mechanic uh, to come and pick up the car, take it to uh, his shop. And uh, this is unfortunately not my official Ferrari mechanic, it's a friend in town. Uh, my real Ferrari mechanic, uh, the official uh, Ferrari uh, certified shop, is unfortunately an hour and a half away from here. So it is a bit complicated taking the car to this person to do, uh, to Ernesto. 
but that is uh, unfortunately how it uh, is going to have to be done. So unfortunately, I won't be able to finish the video uh, today with this, but what's more real time than having a mechanical problem? Uh, this will be the first time I've ever had to trailer the car uh, to, this, to the shop. Probably won't be the last time either. Anyways, that's how it goes. Okay, if I was to put it into the pros of owning such a car, well, it's pretty simple. The way this car makes you feel when you drive it or when you're simply in its presence, it brings you the biggest smile on your face. And every time, I'll come down after dinner sometimes and just look at it. You just can't help falling in love with this car. This car was on my wall when I was 14 year old. Uh, it was a poster. And they always told you, you should never meet your heroes. Well, this one does not disappoint. So that for me is actually the big reason to own the car. What do I hate about it? The cost of ownership is high. Spare parts are not easy to get. There's not many sources for them. And when you do service for this car, for example, the timing belt change, you're looking at at least 4,000 euros to do it. And the second thing of this is the reliability on classic cars. You're never really sure how far you can get. It's always in the back of your mind if something's gonna break down. And this car right now had a fuel pump go on me on the last time I drove it when I was making this video. So it actually is in real time, it's going back for service to my mechanic. So this is the part of the experience that I hate. However, the pros do away the cons and I wouldn't have it any other way. So in end, at the end of the day, the Ferrari Testarossa is staying here. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video on what is it like to live with the classic Ferrari Testarossa. If I didn't answer a question that you have, by all means send it my way and I will answer it. If you're looking for more content on classic car ownership, what is it like to have it, or just see the inspiring drives, please subscribe to the channel or share it with your other car friends. The next time I'm gonna do a video will be about the Ferrari 328, and this is probably the easiest Ferrari to own, or it's your first Ferrari, um, it is a perfect car. So tune in for that video. Until then, thanks for watching.